Chapter Seven of Vice in Its Proper Shape. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Vice in Its Proper Shape, or the wonderful and melancholy transformation of several naughty masters and misses into those contemptible animals which they most resemble in disposition. By Anonymous. Chapter Seven of the Wonderful Transmigration of Master Richard Rustic into the Body of a Bear. In the next apartment into which Mr. Wiseman conducted us, we saw the cub of a bear, who lay upon the floor to which he was chained, without having the good manners to rise when we entered. But when the Brahmin applied his wand to young Bruin's buttocks, he heaved up his shaggy hide with a kind of lazy resentment, and saluted us with a reluctant grin and a savage growl, which plainly intimated that he did not think himself much beholden to us for our company. "'This young brute,' said our conductor, "'is animated by the soul of the late Master Rustic, of clownish memory. His father was a gentleman of rank and fortune, and greatly beloved and respected by all his acquaintance. And if his son Richard had possessed the same virtues and accomplishments, he might afterwards have enjoyed his title and estate with equal comfort and reputation. But as merit does not go by inheritance, like house and land, young Rustic's character was entirely the reverse of his father's. He was of an awkward, clumsy make, and the heaviness of his disposition and the coarseness of his manners perfectly corresponded with the shape of his body. Though he was sent to school very early, and put under the care of the best instructors which the country afforded, it was a considerable time before he could tell his letters, and much longer before he could read with tolerable accuracy. And even then he pronounced everything with such a clownish accent and such a drawling tone, that any stranger would have taken him for a young country bumpkin, who had been used to follow the plough-tail, and not for the son and heir of a wealthy gentleman. He was equally eminent for his neatness and dexterity in the art of penmanship, for even when he was twelve years old, if you had seen the letter which he then sent to his mamma without the knowledge of his master, it was wrote so crooked, not from side to side as it ought to have been, but from corner to corner, and the strokes were all so coarse and uneven, and the whole of the letter so awkwardly spelt, and so unmercifully blotted and bedaubed that you would have thought it had been the elegant epistle of Tony Clodhopper to his grandmother, Goody Lindsay Woolsey. As for his mamma, poor gentlewoman, when she first opened it, she thought it had been sent to her by some impudent shoe-black or chimney-sweeper, but when she had directed her eyes to the bottom and read, though not, I assure you, without the greatest difficulty, from your lovin' and respectful son, Richard Rostick. She was so much oppressed with shame and vexation that she tore the letter into a thousand pieces and was ready to burst into tears. He was alike remarkable for the politeness of his manners and his agreeable address, for he had such a treacherous memory though he had been frequently reminded of the propriety and indeed the necessity of observing those little punctilios of good behavior that he seldom remembered when any company entered the room in which he happened to be sitting either to rise from his chair or take off his hat and when he was told of it either by his parents or his master he would bounce up and snatch of his hat in such an awkward hurry grinning and leering the whole time that you would have thought he had just started from a dream, and even then he would generally forget to finish the rude ceremony by making one of his ducking bows. It is true, indeed, he had been under the hands of a dancing master, but notwithstanding the utmost care and assiduity of his teacher, who was esteemed a very excellent one, 
he was never able to perform a whit better than he does in his present shape. In short, you might as well have kept a hog in training for new market races, or an ox for his majesty to ride upon at a grand review, as have attempted to initiate Master Dicky Rustic in the elements of politeness and good breeding. With such a delicate disposition, and such amiable talents, you will readily perceive that he must have been a most agreeable playfellow. His favorite diversion was that which has been distinguished by the vulgar, by the well-known name of Pully Hawley, in which he so much excelled that whenever he was invited by the young gentlemen and ladies in the neighborhood to play with them, he generally rewarded their civility by tearing their coats or pulling their clothes off their backs before he returned home, so that at last they bestowed upon him, by general consent, the honorable title of Squire Bruin. It must, however, be acknowledged that he was a youth of such impartial justice that he showed as little favor to his own clothes as those of other people. For what with climbing up old trees and rambling over hedges and ditches, to seek for bird's nests, he commonly appeared by dinner-time, how well soever he had been dressed in the morning, in as ragged a coat as he wears at present. It must also be remarked that if the young gentlemen and ladies soon grew weary, as indeed they did, of such a rough playfellow, he, in his turn, was as willing to leave their company as they were to be rid of his. For his chief delight was to associate with such vulgar boys and girls as were of the same rugged disposition as himself. With these he could pull and haul and romp and tear as long as he pleased. And the more active he became in this ragamuffin species of diversion, the more they relished his company. But, upon occasion, he could fight as well as play. I mean when he either was provoked to it by his equals, or tempted to it by the hopes of defrauding of their little property those who he knew had neither strength enough nor courage to resist him. But whatever was his motive either for beginning or suffering himself to be drawn into an engagement, he was very far from confining himself to any rules of honor, or to the established laws of war. For instead of boxing fairly, he would kick, pull hair, bite, and scratch most unmercifully, and never fail to take every advantage of his antagonist after he had brought him to the ground. For these reasons he was soon dignified with the name of Dick Bear even by the vulgar boys in the streets, and most of them afterwards took care never to engage with him unless when there were several other boys present to see fair play. One would think that such a rough-hewn and slovenly mortal, as we have been describing, would have had little regard for any delicacies in the eating way. But whoever draws such a conclusion in favor of our hero, Dicky Rustic, is greatly mistaken. For I can assure you that he has had as nice and dainty a tooth as any lady in the land. Though his father always kept a handsome table, it afforded scarcely anything which was good enough for the palate of Master Richard. Nothing would go down with him but tarts, custards, and the most costly cakes and puddings. For as to good roast and boiled meat, and plain and wholesome pies or dumplings, he would turn up his nose at them as if they were fit only for vagabonds and beggars. Nay, even to this very hour, and in his present clumsy shape, he is almost as dainty as ever, for he is remarkably fond of honey, and if permitted, would often expose his shaggy head and his eyes to the resentment of the bees by disturbing their hives to rob them of their delicious store. It was his fondness for niceties of every kind which shortened his days, and eased his parents of their apprehensions for a son who, if he had lived, would have been a continual plague and disgrace to them. 
for on the day when he entered into the fourteenth year of his age, being indulged rather more than common, he devoured such a quantity of the richest tarts that his stomach could not digest them, so that he soon fell into a violent fever, which in a few days hurried his unworthy soul out of the body of a young country squire, for such he would have been, into the carcass of this hairy and awkward young monster which now stands before you. He so well understands what I have been saying, and is so much vexed at the character I have given of him, which he knows to be a very just one, that if you will promise to quit the room and leave him to himself, he will pleasure you with one of his best dances before you go. Accordingly, after thanking the Brahmin for the account he had given us, we all promised to leave Mr. Bruin to his own meditation, upon which, after taking two or three sulky rounds, the young savage reared himself upon his buttocks, and shuffled a sarabande which lasted a few minutes. When he had finished his dance, he swaggered down again upon his four paws, and by a sullen growl seemed to claim the performance of our promise, an indulgence which we very readily granted him. End of chapter 7 Recording by Rhonda Fetterman